Welcome to India Special. I'm Ajaz Hyder. European Parliament members are visiting Indian occupied and annexed Kashmir. Some of them include those who had previously rejected a trip that was sponsored by an unknown NGO whose roots were traced back by the Indian media itself to the PMO and Indian intelligence. Last month, month India eased its lockdown and restrictions and restored limited internet connectivity. But many political leaders, including the three former chief ministers of occupied Jammu and Kashmir Strait, are still in detention without charge six months after the crackdown. Foreign journalists have so far been denied permission to visit the region. India is attempting to avoid being chastised by an EU resolution on Kashmir and the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act. Earlier in January, a scathing draft resolution had been brought by six groups representing 626 of 751 members of the European Parliament. The EU was supposed to vote on the resolution on January 29th, but postponed the vote to end March. Meanwhile, the BJP has suffered a crushing defeat in the Delhi polls. The economy is slowing down further. Unemployment is rising. The BJP's response to all this is to double down on the CAA while retreating from the National Register of Citizens. To further discuss the situation, we are joined by Mr. Rajiv Jaitley, who is the BJP spokesperson. We also have with us Dr. Yakub Khan Bangish, who's a historian of modern South Asia. And his book, Princely States of Pakistan, came out a few years ago. And we also have with us Muzammil Thakur, who is a Kashmiri activist and joins us from London. Thank you to all three. Let me begin with Mr. Jaitley. Mr. Jaitley. It was a sense of this crushing defeat that the BJP faced despite the Hindutva card that was being played. Well, it was not Hindutva card. It was card of uh, nationalism. Yeah, nationalism is entirely different from Hinduism. Uh, uh, we, the, we, the party in India, believes in nationalism. And that mm -hmm. is the agenda we are following. Uh, but you know, normally people are clubbing it with the Hindutva. Whereas uh, we don't have, we don't distinguish between any religion, whether it is Hindu or it is Muslim. Hindu is entirely different than the uh, uh, Hindu. So I think one who are uh, uh, discussing about Hindu need to understand what is Hindu. Whomsoever stays in Hind India, they follow Hindu. Hindu means they, they, their, uh, their culture, their uh, religion, their everything is nationalism. Uh, nationalism. When it comes to nationalism, it is Hindu. So, uh, that, is, and that is an entirely different thing. I think we need to go in details for to discuss about Hindu. Then person can understand what exactly that. Okay. Let me just pull in uh, Dr. Bangish. Uh, uh, what is Hindu? Pray, Dr. Bangish. Uh, if we uh, go back to some of the founder ideologues of uh, Hindu. Uh, well, I think uh, your uh, guest has actually uh, made a very important point uh, that he is talking about nas nationalism. And as soon as he actually mentioned that, I remembered Sir Rabindranath Tagore, India's first Nobel laureate. And he was against nationalism, but promoted patriotism. Because patriotism is love for the country and, and nationalism leads to jingoism. So, yes, actually what he's doing is exactly what, what something that Rabindranath Tagore wrote against, preached against and lived against. Now, coming to Hindutva specifically, that was an idea that Sarvarkar uh, came up with. Uh, Sarvakar, Golvarkar, and uh, several other ideologues. And their very fantastic idea was that a Hindu is not a person part of a particular religion. A Hindu is someone who considers India their homeland, uh, not just physically, but also spiritually, religiously, in every single way. And that, of course, they conveniently defined as people of the Hindu religion or of allied religions with them. Now, what was very interesting was that when this conversation was going on, they counted the poor Jains and the Sikhs as part of Hinduism. And both these religions vehemently deny being a part of Hinduism. So they kind of mixed these two identities and said, well, being a Hindu, a Hindu is really being an Indian. And because Muslims and Christians look to other lands and are actually spread throughout, throughout the world, therefore they can never be Hindu in that a national sense, and therefore they are not part of this nation, uh, which was a complete bizarre argument because uh, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, uh, Jain, Sikhs, and all these other, other religions have always been a part of India and equally a part of India. You can't distinguish them only if they have affiliation abroad. Well, lots of people who believe in Hinduism have affiliation abroad. Does that also make them not Indian? That's a very bizarre way of looking at nationalism. So uh, what about the, the you know, uh, sort of uh, eulogies 
of, at that time, uh, we're talking about the 30s, of uh, Mussolini and Adolf Hitler and those kind of ideologies that were essentially not only exclusionary, but also very racist and uh, ended up, uh, you know, we saw what happened in Germany and also in Italy in, in during uh, the Second World War. Yes, uh, well, even now, if you go to, uh, you know, normal bookshops in India, you know, Mein Kampf is one of the most popular books and it's one of the most pirated books in India. And it's, and it's very popular with people who actually follow the Hindutva um, ideology. And people like Golwarkar actually wrote about how brilliant Hitler actually was in trying to ensure racial purity because, of course, all these Hindutva ideologues thought that they were Aryans, quite mistakenly, actually, to a large extent, because they weren't. Uh, and therefore, when Hitler spoke about the Aryan race, you know, Arya Varta, that they kind of came up, came up with, that this needs to be an Aryan land, uh, cleared of all people. Uh, fascinatingly enough, if you stick to that Aryan race theory, that excludes over half of India, south of the Vindhyas, they are, they are not Aryans, they are actually, actually Dravidians. But they profess the Hindu religion. So actually, it was a very self-contradictory sort of thing, but it was very much inspired by what Hitler and Mussolini, uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini actually did and eulogized it to a very dramatic and a very embarrassing extent. And what's really fascinating is they are still not embarrassed about it. Right. So that is as far as the Hindutva uh, ideology is concerned. But let me go back to Mr. Jaitley uh, and back to the Delhi polls. Uh, Mr. Jaitley, you said that uh, your card was nationalism. Uh, what was uh, Aam Admi's party card? Clearly, that nationalism card was rejected by people voting in Delhi. First of all, I want to make you clear, clear about Hindutva. I will just take 30, 30 seconds for that. Sure. Uh, I heard that, what Mr. What Mr. Uh, said just now. You know, uh, Hindutva allows everybody, every, they give liberty to everybody to stay in India, to stay in the part of Hindutva freely. Uh, whatever they want to do. Like, you know, we were having Muslim population of 2.5 crore in 1997, whereas today we have population of almost around 30 crores. Whereas, if you talk about Pakistan, the population of Hindu was 30. I mean, there were 30 percent Hindus in Pakistan. Now they have slashed down to 2.5 percent only. Yeah, so because East Pakistan is no more part of Pakistan. But anyway, go on, go on, go on. But when you talk about East Pakistan also, the population has slashed down almost 70 to 75 percent there, Hindu, Hindu population. And in fact, when you talk about Pakistan or Bangladesh, they all were Hindus. I think we, I can't get into the history of that. Whomsoever, whether I'm talking to you or talking to somebody else, we all were Hindus. You know that better than me. But now, yes, the subject is entirely different. Subject is this, that, ah, yes, uh, we, we in Delhi uh, have uh, seen defeat. I mean, uh, we can't deny that. And because there were multiple reasons behind it. Uh, there were uh, free electricity, free water, free all those facilities uh, were involved in this election. Simultaneously, there were other part um, uh, where uh, some people, uh, I mean, like they gathered, they 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 together given vote to be Aam Aadmi Party. So there were different reasons uh, for different, uh, uh, you know. I mean, we were having different uh, picture in Delhi. I, mean, I can't discuss more in that because uh, eventually it was the defeat. It was a defeat. Okay, for eventually, us. eventually it was a defeat. But uh, let me ask you uh, the fact that some of uh, your people campaigning, including the Chief Minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, some other BJP leaders, uh, they made statements uh, that were extremely uh, misogynist uh, against the women, uh, against other minorities. In fact, uh, you know, someone even talked about uh, going and shooting the protesters, and then he was chided by the Election Commission. Uh, so it seems to me, and generally also, to a lot of people in India that this particular BJP government is not Vajpayee 2.0, it is RSS 1.0. Now, that is a sense which is very strong. What would you like to say about that? No, no. I mean, when it comes to election, there are different statements that come from different parties on different occasions. So, I mean, you can't take those statements seriously, but simultaneously, yes, I would say uh, are you saying, saying that someone? Are you saying that if someone incites people uh, to go and shoot protesters, that's something not to be taken seriously or lightly? Not to not to shoot protesters. Not to shoot protesters. It was clear. It's, he said that uh, um, uh, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh clearly said that 
I know how to handle protesters. No, I'm talking, talking about I'm talking law. about another BJP leader who said, "Main jaake unko goli marunga, but I'm going to go and shoot them." I'm not aware of any statement, such statement. Well, yeah, the I election commission actually chided that person. But anyway, no, no, it was entirely. Okay, okay. Stay with me. Stay with me. Let me pull in Muzammil Thakur here. Uh, Muzammil, uh, well, it seems to me uh, this particular EU parliamentary delegation that is now visiting uh, occupied in an ex Kashmir um, and the vote, the upcoming vote. So, uh, give us a sense of what the news from there is, considering that you keep a very close watch and you have your contacts there. Uh, is there something that uh, that uh, is is you know that's happening which is which is interesting which which needs to be looked at and discussed? Uh, I think the any delegation this is the third type of type of delegation that has gone into Indian occupied Kashmir um, and if there was normalcy why is India consistently trying to send a delegation to prove that point if there is democracy inside Kashmir and if India professes to be the largest democracy in the world they should show it off they should uh, let loose the uh, internet blockade they should uh, let people go out into the streets and protest if they wish to so this is another facade that India has is portraying now with this new delegation you have people from Afghanistan from France Germany Austria, you have various different countries that are going there. The problem is that uh, even, I mean, look, how are they able to tweet? Uh, I think most people have been following the Afghanistan uh, representative who has been tweeting. And I think one of the first questions that every single Kashmiri is asking him is, how are you able to tweet? Which VPN are you using? So there are still clampdowns inside Kashmir, irregardless of what these uh, delegation, what the delegation is doing and seeing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, I can't even explain or imagine how, on what basis they are able to profess normalcy inside Kashmir when they are able to physically see the deserted streets. They are f- listening to those people talking about a $2 billion damage to the economy since uh, August the 5th. They are seeing that children are not going to school. They are seeing the hospitals filled. They are you know, watching the streets of people protesting. So I'm not entirely sure on what basis this delegation are tweeting and giving information, false information, to the rest of the world of what is exactly happening inside Kashmir. So it's unfortunate. Okay, how do you look? I mean, you heard what Muzammil said. And his questions are very clear and very obvious, very logical. Um, If there's nothing to hide, then why do you have to put all these restrictions? I mean, if you really want the people to come out and express themselves, and you claim that it's the the most populous democracy in in the world, then so be it. Uh, Let them say what they want to say. But is it that the Indian government uh, is very clear about what the people are going to say if they're allowed to take to the streets? Oh, yes. Uh, I think the Indian government is more than clear uh, that what is going to happen in Kashmir as long as 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 soon as they lift the blockade, because, uh, you know, they have committed a fraud Uh, on the 5th of August till the 5th of August. Kashmir had its own constitution with a stroke of a pen uh, by, you know, the constitutional fraud that they did. Uh, They removed the constitution of Kashmir. They annexed it uh, illegally uh, and they broke their own rules by actually doing it. Uh, So it's not even that they broke some international rules. They even broke their own constitution. So that much is very clear. But it was very interesting that the BJP spokesman was actually, you know, the way he actually explained the Hindutva thing. What's happening now in India is is fascinating because they're actually breaking the Indian nation. One thing which they actually forget that Hindutva is not Indian nationalism. Hindutva is something different which they're trying to bring in. What we now see at Shaheen Bagh in Delhi and that we see at other places and Kashmir used to be one glaring example of it, not just the only one, because we completely forget what's happened, what used to happen in Indian Punjab, what used to happen for decades, which is still actually happening in the northwest of India, you know, Assam, Mizoram, Tripura, all of of that. A lot of atrocities are actually happening there. But those things were being masked because there was no one to speak for them, at least for the Kashmiris. Pakistan was was making a noise. But this is breaking off the Indian nation because the Indian nation, a composite Indian nation, was actually brought together by people like Jawala Nehru and others who wanted to create a composite nation. That was Indian nationalism, not Hindutva. And they're trying to replace Indian nationalism with Hindutva, which is a completely different concept by actually breaking the old thing. So the attack on Kashmir was not just another, yet another, in the series of attacks on Kashmiri right to self-determination and their own voice, but it was an attack on the Indian nation itself. And that is, I think, is the most dangerous thing. India doesn't need an external enemy to break it. You've got a government 
which is in Delhi, that is actually hammering off one by one on it and very interestingly spreading fake news. I am sure you must have heard that the Indian foreign minister tweeted saying that Jawaharlal Nehru did not recommend Sadawal Bhai Patel to be a minister in his cabinet, which is a complete lie. That is, you know, officially the foreign minister of India is tweeting lies, you know, things that have been long settled. So if these are kinds of fake news that they're trying to, sp to sp spread, they, this is a false Indian nationalism that they're they trying to create. And the Kashmiris are, of course, facing the, the brunt of it because from day one, they never wanted to become a part of, of India. They've made it repeatedly clear and it's been clamped down from day one since 1947 there. OK, um, uh, let me also say that uh, Mr. Rajiv Jaitley, uh, he, he dropped the call. Uh, he's not picking up the call now, uh, but we are joined by uh, Mr. Manpreet Singh, who is the spokesperson for the World Sikh Parliament in the United Kingdom. Uh, Ms. Singh, thank you so much for being with us. We are talking about the situation that is unfolding in India. Uh, we all know what happened uh, to occupied uh, uh, Kashmir, which has now been annexed, uh, as uh, Dr. Bangish was saying. Uh, by breaking their own constitutional rules. Uh, there is, uh, you know, rising unemployment. The economy is slowing down further. Uh, the BJP has been defeated in the Delhi polls. Uh, but they have doubled down on this Citizenship Amendment Act. Uh, and uh, this, they seem to now be focusing, going by uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's own tweets on the Ram Mandar. So give us a sense of how do you look at this India that is unfolding before, I, before our eyes? Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Of all um, I would like to wish uh, to all the viewers that the points that you are discussing today, I think, I hope that Indian journalists were doing that too. I'm afraid, but most of the media is, is pro-Modi and pro-Hindutva nowadays in India. So people are not getting the right uh, right proposition of the whole thing that is happening. But I, I think in India at the minute, to be honest, there's no two ways that they are on this mad race and mad rampage of getting converted this so-called secular nation. They always used to say it's a secular nation, largest democracy in the world. But actually, it has turned out into its true colors, which is a Hindu India, a Hindutva India. So, I mean, they always had... If I, if I speak of BJP or RSS or Jansung, which, which had its root, they always had this dream, one constitution, one flag, one language, one nation, and make it into a Hindu nation. They are on this mad race. And whatever is happening is just basically clicking into that agenda. If you see that clampdown, what happened in Kashmir, CAA, all the other things, NRC, Everything is basically heading towards there. Now, Ram Mandir, we all know what's happened to Babri Masjid a few years ago. We all know what's happened to uh, Akal Takht for Sikhs in India. We all know what has happened to the minorities in India, whether it be Sikhs, Dalits, Muslims, Kashmiris. Anywhere in India, wherever you go, the minorities and the poor are being suppressed from day one. Now, looking at the current situation, uh, as you were saying, this, there is no two ways that people in India need to wake up to the reality. And I am really happy on one thing, that it's not just Muslims who are opposing the CEA. It's mainly students, and they belong from any religion. They belong from every religion that we know of. They know that whatever is happening is basically not in line with India's human rights obligations. And to quote here, United Nations has commented this itself. Now, what does this mean? I think the world needs to wake up to the reality that we need to do something before it's too late. Now, I don't know whether you've touched upon this issue that this convoy of, uh, uh, you know, several diplomats, which is visiting yeah. Jammu and Kashmir. Now, obviously, uh, there was a convoy last month, and I would like to give some quotations from them. The, the convoy which visited last month, they said things looked calm, but we only had a few short time out of the window of the car to assess the situation. So it was tightly choreographed with no room for independent meetings, the last trip that the convoy had. Now, they also said, and this is not me, this is that diplomat saying, they told the truth, 
but not not necessarily the whole truth now basically what the idea i am getting here is that they are trying to just may, maybe you know whitewash their image now that the internet has started after several months of clamp down but former jammu kashmir cm he is still in 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 detention center uh, you know uh, in house arrest without any charges from last 6 months so many leaders of the kashmir they're facing the same thing so what uh, are, i'm what, i'm happy i'm happy mr singh that you talked about the yes indeed we we were discussing this before you joined um and uh, thank you so much for your views on this uh, let me go back to uh, muzammil uh, here muzammil uh, now <laughs> it seems to me that with the exception of the die hard bjp officials no one is really buying the narrative that that is being put out by these people and uh, and uh, you know i want to stress once again the point that you made about the afghan uh, delegate uh, and and yes i also saw his tweets and it's a very good question of how uh, in 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 god's name was he using uh, the internet how was he tweeting uh, from occupied kashmir which does not have the internet facility but now give me a sense of how you look at the the caa protests uh and there's been a ground swell there uh do you think that this pushback would be enough to put the bjp back in its place or do you think this is a reversal of the hindutva tide or is it just a moment and it won't become an episode It's an it's an interesting question because uh, most often most often than not what happens is revolutions are either stamped or they change or they create a massive ripple and a massive change in society. At at this present time, it seems that there is uh, um, an ongoing movement inside India, all over India, not to, not to uh, put a fine point on it, that. nobody is happy with the bjp and i think the delhi polls the polls are a clear indication of uh, uh, of the sentiments inside india but you also have to remember that uh, delhi is a very small one part union territory of a very massive population of 1.2 1.3 billion people where uh, as i think dr bangash has also mentioned there is a lot of fake news being propelled and we still have to recognize that india predominantly is a hindu nation it is uh, the population is majority of hindus now there may be different costs and there may be different ideologies some people may be secular liberal right wing left wing but ultimately ultimately the entire media is controlled by the government controlled by the bjp whatever the bjp narrative is is what is going to be fed to the population if tomorrow they declare that every single muslim is a terrorist that is fine uh, if not every hindu that will accept it but a majority of them would especially those that are living under the poverty line especially those that are taking benefits from the government especially those that uh, um Uh, reap rewards from protesting on the streets let's also remember that uh, a young chap a hindu chap that was radicalized by a bjp leader uh, he used a gun inside yeah. on the in delhi on the streets while the police were watching and that bullet somehow managed to injure a kashmiri and then he was taken uh, and arrested but the problem is that he was brandishing a gun in public while the police were watching until he used that weapon and this is the problem inside india that he was an educated young boy he had friends he grew up among uh, other people uh, of his generation of different religions and backgrounds and yet he was radicalized as well i think he, uh, correct me if i'm wrong but this is the definition of zionism what is happening inside india absolutely. let alone what is happening inside kashmir absolutely now i have up the segment but uh, bangish very quickly Uh, we constantly talk about modi and yes we have seen that modi's government uh, uh, you know broke the constitutional arrangement and all that but frankly uh, and i am specifically talking about kashmir occupied kashmir uh, even the secular congress uh, basically what they were as pankaj mishra says this was the secular civilizing mission uh in which uh, you know uh, they somehow want to subsume kashmir into the body politic of india uh that is something that we seem to uh, forget now with modi there just give me a sense of that 
Well, true. You know, uh, it just reminds me of a of a of a comment I think uh, Mr. L K Advani once once made that now he's considered um, a liberal because mm. if you compare him to him to Modi, uh, then he actually is quite a liberal. So I so so I think the Congress, of course, was up to no good. And and let's not forget it was Indira Gandhi, a Congress party, that actually brought the emergency in. Mm. So they've actually have their commission of of sins too. But Modi has just surpassed them so fantastically that even they are in shock. So all of that background, of course, remains. But the way Modi has actually done this and has undermined the constitution, that is very novel. And I would say that, you know, even though I do have hope in Shaheen Park and, you know, all what's happening in India, by the end of it, I think the courts do have to come to the rescue because they are one of the vanguards of the constitution. And they have been doing it for a long time. It's sad that, that at the moment they are not even listening to the Kashmir case. Uh, but this is a very important moment where the constitu constitution of India should be saved because it is not just the Kashmiris they are now after. It is after Kash Kash Kashmir, it is Assam, then it is West Bengal, then it is the south of India, then it is not just Muslims and then Christians and then others, it will be Hindus and castes of Hindus. So this is something that will destroy the core of what is their India and create problems for the whole region. So I think this needs to be really nip nipped in the bud now. So this is the Frankenstein that we are now witnessing. Thank you so much, Muzammil Takur. Thank you, Dr. Yaqub Khan Bangash. We shall take a short break and return to discuss US Taliban talks on an Afghan peace deal. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. The Trump administration is seeking to announce a deal to de-escalate violence with the Afghan Taliban as soon as this week. This was reported by CNN, the U.S. cable network, quoting two U.S. defense officials familiar with the discussions. The prospective deal is being described as, quote, reduction in violence announcement, unquote, which would call for a ceasefire period between the coalition and the Taliban with hopes of a peace deal being reached in the near future. The U.S. is aiming for a peace deal to help execute President Donald Trump's desire to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan. The first step is expected to reduce the current level of troops from 12, 13,000 to 8,600. Defense Secretary Mark Esper told reporters in Brussels Wednesday, there is a reduction in violence proposal on the table and said, I'm here consulting with allies about it and I have nothing further to announce at this time. This seems to cut out the Afghan security forces from the reduction in violence deal and does not really define what that means. To discuss this, we have with us Dr. Chris Alexander, who is a Canadian politician and a former diplomat. He was also the first resident ambassador to Afghanistan from 2003 to 2005. We also have with us Imtiaz Gul, who is an analyst and joins us from Islamabad. Thank you to both guests. Uh, Ambassador Alexander, let me begin with you. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, and this was a couple of weeks ago also, we were discussing this on this very program, about what kind of negotiating hand is President Trump giving to his special envoy uh, dealing with the Taliban if he actually announces during the State of the Union address that he's going to pull the troops back. So uh, do you think that that would be considered a wise strategy? <laughs> well... I think at, at every sta stage of uh, U.S. involvement in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, we have seen uh, inconsistency and sometimes missteps. Uh, we have seen presidents, including Obama, including Bush, uh, announce, make announcements that were premature. But we've also seen that the United States, uh, two things. First, the United States uh, wants to reduce its military footprint in Afghanistan has done that over recent years, but is also capable of going into reverse, of increasing its footprint if it sees its national interest being threatened. Secondly, we have seen very clearly that, in, in, particularly over the past year, that the U.S. on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, are committed to not making the same mistakes in Afghanistan that were made in Iraq. You'll recall that under the Obama administration, every last soldier was put, at one point was pulled out of Iraq, training missions were ended, uh, and essentially state authority collapsed, uh, and there was a civil war which led to civil war in Syria as well. The costs of that are still playing out. They were disastrous for the region and the world, and the United States doesn't want to repeat that experience in Afghanistan. So uh, this announcement of troop reductions is contingent 
on the Taliban uh, doing what, the, what, what is required of them, which is reducing violence and ultimately achieving a ceasefire. Okay, um, let me go to Imtiaz Gul on this. Um, Imtiaz, what do you think of this? As I said, what it says about reduction in violence against the coalition seems to cut out the Afghan National Security Forces from this. Uh, do I, you know, do you think that my sense is correct, or do you think that would also include the Afghan National Security Forces? Yeah, of course, it's it's uh, basically mutual reduction in violence. And this means uh, both the Afghan Defense Forces as well as the Americans are also undertaking to stop uh, attacking or carrying out the night raids. Uh, and in return for the Taliban promise to hold fire for about a week, this will be a testing trial time uh, before they uh, sign the deal, both in, in Doha as well as uh, more, most probably also in Kabul. Uh, so depending on what the Trump administration eventually decides, whether Mike Pompeo signs the, uh, the one deal in Doha and President Trump flies to Kabul or vice versa. So there's uh, quite a lot uh, in the making. And coincidentally, I'm just coming uh, out of a multilateral uh, a dialogue of experts on the future of Afghanistan beyond the peace deal. So we have been uh, discussing all these issues uh, uh, from uh, for the past two days. And the consensus was that uh, everybody is craving for peace in Afghanistan. However, the most difficult uh, challenge uh, would be to put together a grand shura of elders of about 50, 60 people representing a broad range of uh, uh, political parties, which eventually then nominates a council to negotiate the intra-Afghan deal. So uh, while there is a lot of expectation uh, and optimism, there's also fears that perhaps we could see a replay of what happened immediately after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan in February 1989. Absolutely. Uh, we should take back to Ambassador Alexander's point about the U.S. having learned its lesson in Iraq. Frankly, Ambassador, that was a lesson that the U.S., uh, you know, indirectly also learned in Afghanistan with the Soviet withdrawal, because uh, once the Soviets withdrew, uh, the U.S. thought that this entire thing was over and it pulled back. And we saw what happened during the 90s. Uh, but uh, do you think that this really squares up with the kind of uh, talk that is, uh, uh, you know, that's coming out of the White House? Uh, it does not uh, seem to me that President Trump is really interested in keeping some kind of tripwire force or some kind of force that would perhaps be a symbol of or U.S.'s commitment to stability in Afghanistan. Those of us who've been watching Afghanistan for decades now uh, are used to this kind of statement from U.S. presidents and indeed other world leaders. It's popular to say you're bringing the troops home. That is what uh, the U.S. electorate would like to see. Uh, that's what audiences in other NATO countries would like to see. A at the same time, no president wants to and no NATO leader wants to be known for having lost Afghanistan, for having uh, triggered a new civil war there, let alone a Taliban takeover. Uh, and so I think there's a, a spectrum of options still open to the White House and the administration. They're trying to get a deal. They're trying to achieve a reduction in, vi in, in violence. But uh, a longer term U.S. footprint in Afghanistan is still very much possible. And look, remember that President Trump drew a very sharp distinction uh, in his bid for election four years ago with the Obama administration over Iraq. He blamed the chaos in Iraq and Syria uh, and all the threats to U.S. interests uh, flowing from more Iranian influence in Iraq, further to that withdrawal, on Obama's uh, hasty move to the exits in 2011. He's not going to repeat that experience, I think. Uh, and, and there's a much larger community in the U.S., as you say, who remember the experience of 1988-89, uh, when U.S. attention pivoted from South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan to uh, Central Europe as the Warsaw Pact and then the Soviet Union were starting to creak, uh, sway, and then, and then ultimately disintegrate. Um, that was a mistake. 
The disengagement cost everyone hugely, most of all Pakistanis and Afghans. Uh, but uh, the U.S. knows that it cannot go down that same route again this time. Okay, thank you. That was Ambassador Chris Alexander speaking with us. Back to Imtiaz Gul here. Uh, Imtiaz, uh, do you get a sense, since you just mentioned uh, this two-day uh, conference that you attended, uh, do you get a sense that uh, while it has been a fairly long process, uh, more than a year now, uh, to get some kind of deal between the U.S. and the Taliban, that it would be even more complicated to actually get something out of uh, the intra-Afghan dialogue? Well, th those are the fears. Uh, most of the participants, uh, about eight of them, draw, came from uh, Afghanistan itself, including former ambassadors, ministers, and members of parliament, that the actual challenge would be to thrash out uh, a deal between or among the Afghans themselves. Uh, it's a very tricky situation right now. The uh, Afghanistan political landscape is extremely divided, polarized to the extent that you only have a very small minority led by President Ashraf Ghani on the one side and the rest of the Afghan leadership on the other side. Plus, uh, this majority is inclined to having a favorable deal with the Taliban as as legitimate stakeholders uh, in, in Afghanistan, we had somebody who also said that they are sons of soil. So there's a, still a, 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 there could still be some spoilers uh, through a small number of people, which we call uh, the not really inclined towards Pakistan or inclined towards uh, the Taliban, who may spoil the entire deal because they I'm, I'm, uh, Imtiaz, I'm happy. Sorry, the Taliban as, as terrorists. Absolutely, Imtiaz, this is uh, this is a very interesting point. Uh, I'm sure you must have come across, uh, you know, uh, this came as a surprise, actually, uh, that Hamdullah uh, uh, Mohib, the Afghan NSA, went to India, and he actually surprised his Indian host by suggesting that India should, now that the U.S. is sort of uh, uh, thinning out its, its uh, uh, you know, uh, forces footprint, that uh, India should provide a division or two or three brigades uh, in Afghanistan for stability, and the Indians were completely surprised. Uh, and, and, you know, you, Mohib, has also been very critical of this whole process. So give me a sense, now that you mentioned that these are the spoilers, uh, Amrullah Saleh uh, was also uh, ran on, on uh, Ashraf Ghani's ticket. So do you think these people can actually spoil any kind of deal? I mean, uh, what is your sense? Well, I, you know, potentially they could play the spoilers, uh, just because India has developed a stake and these people, Rehmatullah Nabil, Amrullah Saleh, uh, Hamdullah Mohib, uh, there are many others uh, who pander to the Indian leadership because India wants to retain its constituency uh, in Afghanistan and then square up with Pakistan through uh, that lobby. So this is a very tricky situation. However, uh, if the majority of Afghans were to play their cards right, uh, dispassionately, there still is a chance that they could hammer out a deal when they sit down across the table with the Taliban for a better future. So while there are reservations uh, on the spoilers, the fears about people uh, just playing dirty, there's still also hope because the dominant majority is on, on, one hand, on the one side and they just want to push the peace process as much as they can. Okay. Um, Imtiaz, I'm joined by uh, Masood Rahimi, uh, who is a young uh, politician and peace ambassador, uh, joins me from Kabul. Mr. Rahimi, thank you for your time. We were talking about this reduction in violence deal that the, the Americans are talking about, although uh, its exact definition is still unclear. Uh, but it seems to me that it uh, cuts out the Afghan national security forces from that deal. What is your sense of what this is all about? As we already have decides for Afghanistan situation right now, it is a little bit very down. Uh, we are going on the peace discussion. Maybe uh, a very soon we will be in the uh, result, the real result. Maybe government discuss, uh, discussion will be started in Doha 
about uh, coming peace by flipping off the uh, United States with Taliban. So uh, right now, as I see uh, and I review the situations, uh, we are waiting for the peace discussions and that the real decision of uh, United States of America or uh, the of Afghanistan, our people is really waiting for that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. That was Masood Rahimi speaking with us. Before I wrap up the segment, Imtiaz, very quickly, uh, since you talked about the political divisiveness in Kabul, uh, we, uh, you know, the, we still don't know about the, the results of the presidential elections. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, that is uh, becoming a sore point uh, for the entire uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, camp and uh, uh, the Taliban had hoped that uh, once they strike a deal with uh, the United States, that this that this administration would become irrelevant. However, until the intra-Afghan negotiation starts, the President Ghani is likely to remain the president because he still claims that he has won the election. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somehow, the opposition is probably also yeah. not pressing this point uh, because, well. in view of this all this impending peace deal uh, with the, between the Taliban and the U.S. C correct. Thank you. Sabazim Tiaz Gul speaking with us. This is all for tonight from Indus Special. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Meanwhile, for latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Good night and goodbye.